This is a Saddleback Church podcast. If God is real, why do people suffer? There are tons of religions out there. How do we know which God is real? Why does God hide himself? Hasn't science disproved God? These are all questions that people wrestle with. Yes, even Christians. Maybe they are questions you have asked yourself at one point, or maybe you're asking them right now. It's important for people, yes, all people, to ask these types of questions that get to the fundamental nature of reality, the existence, and of God. The process of asking and responding to questions about God is called apologetics. And my guest today just happens to be one of the most well-known Christian apologists in the world. Now, to many of you, he may not need an introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. Lee Strobel was an award-winning legal editor at the, the Chicago Tribune before his life was radically changed. In an effort to disprove the existence of God, Lee ended up giving his life to Jesus, and since then has become the best-selling author of more than 40 books and curricula, and founded the Lee Strobel Center for Evangelism and Applied Apologetics at a, a Colorado Christian University. In the interest of disclosure, Lee also served as a teaching pastor at Saddleback Church many years ago. Now, Lee has a new book out today called, Is God Real? Exploring the Ultimate Question of Life. And in this conversation, we're going to talk about where Christians tend to go wrong and how we think about apologetics, what he's learned from decades of people asking questions about God, and how you can answer the questions that people are really asking. My name is is Jason Wheeland, and this is Doable Discipleship, a Saddleback Church podcast, part of the Saddleback family of podcasts. Now, my conversation with Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. You know, I love Saddleback. I haven't been a teaching pastor there a number of years ago and still love the people, still love the church and uh, always grateful to participate. And the people in the church still love you. I remember oh, uh, oh. I, I remember seeing you, I think you came out a number of years ago for our, our Amundsen Lecture Series on, on apologetics. And I, right. I remember that weekend well. So, so again, thank you for your time. I, I'm really excited to dive into this topic of apologetics. And I, I, I've been using this question frame in a number of episodes recently, and it's really elicited some some good thinking, some good conversation. So I want to pose it yeah. this way. What are we getting wrong about apologetics? Yeah, um, good question. I'd say a few things. Uh, first of all, I think a lot of people, what they get wrong is thinking that apologetics is optional. Mm. Um, you know, actually, First Peter 3.15 says to every follower of Jesus Christ that we're to always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks us to give the reason for the hope that we have, but to do it gently and respectfully. Yeah. And so that's a that's a, a command for all followers of Jesus to be will, be ready not only to explain the gospel and share the gospel, but to uh, defend the gospel and give reasons why we believe what we believe. I think some people think, yeah, it's optional. If you need it, you use it. If you don't, you shouldn't. But um, the other thing I think is that a lot of people think um, that you can't argue people into the kingdom of God. Mm. I've heard that a lot. Yeah. Well, you can't argue people in the kingdom of God, so I use apologetics. Well, that's just a misunderstanding, I think, of apologetics. Uh, the way I picture it is, you know, if you drive down the highway and you see those construction barriers yeah. along the road, uh, those are like barriers that people have between them and God. And what apologetics does, it just knocks down those barriers so that we can ultimately come face to face with God and uh, be able to then make the choice to receive him as our forgiver and leader. Yeah. So 
I think it's it, you know it's 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 not optional. It's it's <laughs> mandatory, and uh, and it works. I mean, that's the other thing. It, it it works because God is a rational creature, and we are rational creatures, and consequently, it it syncs up that we should be able to use some rational arguments and evidence to tell people about God. Well, I think that's I think that's an important point because if we are called to go and make disciples of all nations, if we look at it from a, a, a great commission idea and we're called to have an yeah. answer for all questions, that that is implying that questions will likely come. Is is you yes. can go and share the good news, but people will have questions because as they have lived their lives, have gone through things, they've probably thought about things. They've thought about the nature of reality, of science, all this stuff, and they've right. and they may come up with all these questions. And if if you don't have the answer, if you say you know what? That's a great point. <laughs> you know, if or, yeah. or, or you know what, I have no idea. That bamboozles me. Then, <laughs> then you're really not taking that next step. You, you know, right. and so I, I love that idea of breaking down these barriers because really it's just saying, hey, there there are answers to a lot of these things. There are there, there's a lot of thinking that's been done. And, yes. and God doesn't yes. leave us to our own devices in that. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. I mean, we have 2,000 years of church history where virtually every question has come up along the way. And yeah. uh, thoughtful Christians have provided responses that are biblical and, and also make sense because they are biblical. And um, so I think we have to encourage questions in people. It's okay to let people know it's fine to have questions. Don't yeah. be embarrassed to have questions. Mm. Uh, you know, you think of John the Baptist if anybody should have known the identity of Jesus being the son of God, it was John the Baptist, but he gets arrested. And then he starts wrestling with doubts and questions. And he wonders, is, this, is Jesus really the one we've been waiting for? Mm. So what does he do? Instead of just wallowing in that, he sends his followers to go track Jesus down and ask him point blank, are you the one we've been waiting for? We'd wait for somebody else. Yeah. So how does Jesus react? Does he get mad? How dare John ask a question or express a hesitation about my identity? No. He says, quote, go back to John and tell him about what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. In other words, tell him about the evidence that mm -hmm. you've seen with your own eyes that convinces you that I am the one I claim to be. So they go back and they do that. But this doesn't uh, disqualify John from any role in the kingdom of God because he dared to ask a question. It's after this incident that Jesus gets up before a group and says, among those born of women, there's no one greater than John. Mm -hmm. John, the guy who dared to ask a question. So I think we have to let Christians and spiritual seekers know that it's okay to ask questions. The key thing is to pursue answers. Yeah, it, it, and, and don't forget that call from the great commandment to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's right. So it, 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 there's that encouragement to to put that put the effort of intellectual honesty and thinking into your faith and knowing that God right. will meet you there that that's that right. and um and that's that encouragement too any pursuit of apologetic understanding is not only for the benefit of others but for your own self as well as you continue to grow and hone and bolster your faith Absolutely. It, it deepens your own faith and it prepares you and gives you confidence to be able to share your faith with others. And Jason, the other thing is, you know, we live in an increasingly skeptical world, mm -hmm. e even at sometimes a hostile world sure. toward the faith. Um, I was talking to a guy whose granddaughter was six years old. She was going to a public school. She was in kindergarten. She was on the playground during recess. And the other children were making fun of her and taunting her because she believes in God. Mm -hmm. Oh, you believe in fairy tales. You believe in make-believe. And, you know, our grandchildren, our children, our great-grandchildren, our friends and relatives, they're going to face increasing skepticism about their faith mm -hmm. uh, more than other generations have, perhaps or some other generation, certainly our generation. Sure. And so we have to be prepared to equip them. And so when we are ready to give an answer, we can pass that along to our children, our grandchildren. Here's here's some things to understand about why we believe what we believe. So you've been writing now about apologetics and meeting with people who have questions for decades now. One of the things that yeah. I know you 
at least used to do, I'm not sure if you still do this, but when you are at an airport, oftentimes you'll say, hey, I'm at this gate or I'm at this area of the airport. If you have questions, come and find me. I'm happy right. to talk about that with you. And yeah. So, so you've been hearing people's questions for decades now. What yeah. would surprise Christians then to learn about what questions people are asking? Well, you know, things have changed a bit. I will say the number one question that you get, and I did a national survey a few years ago on this where I asked uh, a cross-section of Americans, if you could ask God any one question and you knew he'd give you an answer right now, what would you ask him? And by far, the number one question is some permutation of why would a loving God allow suffering in the world? Yeah. That's number one. And that has endured through the generations. Sure. But this, interestingly, though, a new question that is really, in some philosophers' opinion, has become the number two objection to Christianity has to do with the hiddenness of God. Mm. Um, if God is real, why is he so hidden? Why doesn't he make himself more obviously evident that there be no doubt that he exists? And, uh, you know, John Steingart, who was the um, musician, the, the singer, the vocalist for the uh, Christian rock group Hawk Nelson mm. in 2022, shocked young evangelicals by walking away from the faith mm. and didn't become an atheist. But he, he left Christianity, at least for now, because he said, God is hidden. I can't find him. I don't sense he's there. Mm. And um, so this is an increasingly common objection. So in my new book, Is God Real?, I deal with both these questions. If God is real, why is there suffering? And if God is real, why is he so hidden? And uh, I interviewed experts on those topics uh, to provide as satisfying answers and prepare Christians to respond to those, but also to be a resource you can give to a non-Christian who may have those questions. I think what's interesting about those two questions being perhaps the most popular, most common questions um, that people have about faith is it seems like generally, and I would imagine a lot of the time, if not most of the time, there's an underlying emotional element to those questions, that people mm -hmm. are coming with those questions yes. because they have gone through suffering themselves or they've seen yes. suffering in loved ones, even loved ones who were of faith, or as, as, with the hiddenness question, maybe they have tried to call out to God and just not seen the answer they were wanting kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, God just hides himself. He, he, he keeps himself from me. But for yeah. the Christian to know when they are met with those questions, if those questions come up, it's, it, it, it's important to think about like, there is a person behind this question who is bringing yes. their history, their, their experience a lot. It's because it's not, it's not an objection from science. It's not an objection from there. It's an objection of their own personal experience with God, which is well, an important point. This is exactly why I've changed my approach in dealing with those questions over the years. Mm. It used to be when I would get into a conversation with a non-believer and, and I would ask him to get the conversation going, hey, if you could ask God any one question and you knew he'd give you an answer right now, yeah. what would you ask him? And as I say, most of the time, it's going to be some permutation of, okay, well, why does God allow suffering? So, 10 years ago, when somebody would say that to me, I would give them a five-point sermon <laughs> on why God allows suffering. But I don't do that anymore. What I do now is, if they ask that question, why does God allow suffering? I ask a follow-up question. The follow-up question is, okay, of all the potential questions in the universe, why did you ask that one? Mm. Now you get to the emotional side. Now you get to the personal side. Now they say, because... We lost a child in childbirth five years ago, and I want to know where was God when that happened. Or my wife's been diagnosed with uh, cancer, and I want to know where's God in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. Now you're getting to the motivational question, the the motivational issue, the 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 um, um, personal topic. And so, what these people don't need is someone to give them a five point sermon. What they need is someone to be Jesus to them, mm -hmm. to put their arm around their shoulder, to comfort them, to empathize with them, to um, to listen to them, to um, respond to them on a loving, personal level. And then as opportunities arise, to bring a gentle answer. But I've learned over the years, as you say, that most of the time these questions are driven by some personal issue. Let's get down to that personal issue because God can meet them there 
in a way that uh, he, he may not if we just give them a quick um, theological answer. Yeah, one of the quotes that Pastor Rick would say a lot was, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's the exact kind yeah. of um, application of that, right? Yes. That's where God can use you. Because if you just, as you said, if you just provided the answer, if you said, well, in C.S. Lewis's uh, book on the problem of right. suffering, we can see, you know, like, no, it doesn't really go so far. But but when you are able to meet the person in their space, just like, and, that, and, that, and that's where God is too. God is with them in their suffering. And if you're able to be that, those hands and feet and just say, hey, like, I, 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 I love to hear about your life, you know, and, and bring it back to that point and they can see your love, your care, you know, it, just like what the gospel says is Jesus looked at them with compassion. If you're, if that's right. what they see rather than an apologetic a jujitsu robot who's just like, ah, I know this one. <laughs> right. It can go it does, a long often way. What happens, yeah, often what ends up happening is um, you get into a great conversation about on a very personal level about why they're suffering or why they've asked that question. And then it opens the door to more theological answers and more apologetic responses. Yeah. Um, but but it's, it's preceded by a personal personal response mm. that warms things up and lets someone know that I care about you. I really, God loves you. I love you. I'd like to, I'd like to be your friend. I'd like yeah. to help you work through this stuff. But first let's acknowledge you're hurting and, and let's um, let me be Jesus to you in comforting you. Mm. I love that. And that's such a great reminder for everybody who's listening. I wanted to, to ask, so you've written about a number of the, like the broadest, biggest topics and looked at them from this the case of idea right so you've written about yeah. jesus and creation and heaven and miracles and faith which topic took you maybe down the most uh eye-opening thought-provoking path of research and writing I think my new book, Is God Real, uh, did that. And the reason is it incorporates the, the broad range of evidence that uh, points to Christianity being true. Mm. In other words, in my book, The Case for Christ, I dealt largely with the reliability of the Bible and um, the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. Um, uh, in my book, The Case for Creator, I, I look more at science. But this book really draws on science, philosophy, history, um, all these different strands of evidence. There are about 20 lines of evidence that point toward the truth of Christianity. Mm. And by focusing on this wide range of evidence, I think it builds a, a clear and compelling case that Christianity accounts for the evidence better than any other worldview, better than atheism, better than pantheism, um, better than any other faith system. And so uh, I found this book to be especially um, exciting to work on. <laughs> As you know, in my books, um, I don't sit there and pose as the expert. Uh, I use my journalism background to yeah. track down people with doctorates from Cambridge University <laughs> and, and uh, you know major uh, um, universities and sit down with them and ask them the tough questions I had as a skeptic. And uh, that allows me to stand in the shoes of the reader and ask the questions that are probably on their minds mm -hmm. and uh, and see what these experts have to say. So uh, so I found this book particularly exciting to uh, to work on. Which part, it, it, was there a question in particular, maybe one that you had thought of early on in the writing process for Is God a Real, that you were seeking answers, that you were like, hmm, I, I, I really, I, I, I wonder what people are going to say about this one. Like, this one seems the most... Uh, I I don't know what the word is like. Ripe for 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 a a difficult conversation around it. Is yeah. there one question that led you into a a uh, maybe more excited space to find the person who's going to answer this one? Yeah, well, you know, the first part of the book, I deal with the affirmative evidence that points to our Christianity as being true. Then I deal with these two objections. And the one objection that I found new mm. and um, perplexing mm. and, um, um, you know, really wrestle with is, is this issue of the hiddenness of God. Oh, yeah. Uh, if God loves us, if God has a re uh, wants a relationship with us, why doesn't he make his, uh, his existence much more obvious to us? 
And and you go, well, that's a that's a legitimate question. Uh, John Steingard, the, yeah, yeah. you know, the musician from Hawk Nelson, that was the thing that chased him away from the faith. So this is this is an important quest question. And I'd never really addressed that in any of my writings before. Hmm. And so I sat down with a philosopher and uh, and really worked through it. And, you know, it's pro- probably a 30 page chapter. And it, it really delves into this issue, I think, in a in a provocative way. And in a way that satisfies your heart and soul so that you finish the chapter and you go, yeah, I get it. There are reasons for this. And it does make sense that God um, uh, behaves the way that he does and that we behave the way that we do. So um, so I think that one is the one that, uh, you know, was really the biggest challenge and eye opener for me. Mm. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm sure that's a question that a lot of the listeners are going to, you know, be interested to learn more about. So again, the yeah. book comes out today. <laughs> it's available. <Yeah. laughs> so, so for Is God Real, you see, so you already mentioned a few of the questions that are just like the prominent questions from the book, right? So why is yeah. there suffering? Which God is, is real? I think there's... Yes, well, and science and faith. Does science contradict faith or does it support faith? Exactly right. Exactly right. So uh, there's one question that I was hoping to focus in on a little bit, because mm-hmm. I think it's really a foundational question, which is, if God is real, what difference does it make? Yeah. I think, yeah. like, t- to me, that's kind of like the all signs point to this question right here, right? Right, so right. For, <laughs> so for, qu- for Christians who are listening, and, and maybe they're thinking about people in their life who don't know Jesus. I'm yeah. curious how they should think about this question of what difference does it make if God is real in light of evangelistic efforts. Yeah. You know, um, I, there's an evolutionary biologist, William Provine. Uh, he died a few years ago, but he was in a debate with a Christian. And in that debate, he said, you know, there are five inescapable implications for humankind if God is not real. So when you say, you know, what does it matter? What and what were the implications? He said there are five implications, mm. and he spelled them out. Number one, it would mean there is no evidence for God. Number two, there is no life after death. Number three, there is no absolute foundation for right and wrong. Number four, there is no absolute meaning for life. And number five, people don't really have free will. So these are the most fundamental issues <laughs> of all. I mean, if there is no God, seriously, there is we don't really have free will, free will, there's no absolute meaning for life. You can't even say what is objectively right and wrong. Uh, there is no life after death. I mean, this is uh, the, these are the biggest issues of all. Yeah. And then of course you get into issues of purpose and meaning. Yeah. Um, you know, three quarters of millennials say that they're searching for a sense of purpose in life. Mm. Well, good luck trying to find it if God doesn't exist, because <laughs> because we're just a blip that's going to be just uh, um, here for a heartbeat of a moment in history um, on a on a little planet in the middle of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> if if there is no God, there is no meaning. Yeah. You have to make up your own meaning, and and um, and it just becomes platitudes. Uh, real meaning comes from the existence of God himself. And so um, I, I and, you know, you look at um, depression and anxiety among young people, you know, look at Generation Z, you know, studies have shown this is just from the Centers of Disease Control just uh, in this year, 2023, it says almost 60 percent of female students experienced persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness during the last year and nearly 25 percent have made a suicide plan 25 mm. percent of young women have made suicide plans i'm telling you um why is that because we live in a culture that's increasingly questioning questioning the existence of god the number of americans who believe that god exists has sunken to 81 mm-hmm. percent when i was in high school in the 1960s, it was 98% of Americans believe that God exists. Yeah. Now it's down to 81%. And, and so as our culture begins to increasingly be hostile or skeptical toward the existence of God, we see the natural result, which is an influx of anxiety and hopelessness and purposelessness among people. 
Um, and th- th- we can see that all around us. Mm-hmm. So does this make a difference? Does this make a practical impact on our life? Absolutely. To me, it is the foundational issue of all. Hmm. And your time as as the at the uh, Lee Strobel, it's, it's so aptly named, the Lee Strobel Center for Evangelism and Applied Apologetics. What is, I'm assuming that that is a, that everything that you were just talking about, about this yeah. rise of anxiety, of, de- of depression, of isolation, of loneliness, all these things yeah. are kind of yeah. Yeah. coming at each other at the same time. What sort of questions and and what sort of um, motivations do you see students c- coming into your program with and hoping that they're going to get out of the program something to take into this world that they are inheriting and are so and are so much a part of? Yeah, they want to know: are, are my feet firmly planted on quicksand? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or are my feet, or can my feet be firmly planted on something solid? Uh, like the word of God and the truth of God. Uh, they're looking for something to anchor their life with. And, and the Bible talks about, uh, for instance, the resurrection of Jesus being an anchor for our faith. Um, and uh, so what we're finding is that young people, um, you know, some people might think, oh, young people aren't that interested in apologetics and evidence for the faith. No, the opposite is true because they're getting hit on the internet by all kinds of often outdated and ridiculous objections to the faith, but they don't, they don't know if that they just think, oh, here's a good argument against Christianity, yeah. uh, not knowing it's been refuted for a hundred years. Um, and, and so we find people want to know, and, uh, we get people who are in our program who are, um, uh, planning a career in apologetics and evangelism, uh, perhaps on the staff of a church yeah. or, or an independent ministry. Uh, but a lot of people take our courses who just want answers. In fact, you know, we have not only master's degrees, which are co- completely uh, accredited and fully online for people that want to get a master's degree in apologetics or evangelism, mm-hmm. or an undergraduate degree, a bachelor's degree, but we decided to come up with uh, what we call certificate courses. Hmm. So these are for the kind of people you mentioned, people who don't want a degree, but they want to take a course on, for instance, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus or science and faith or world religions or Islam or whatever. Hmm. And they can take these at their own pace, fully online. They're incredibly inexpensive. And if they take five of these courses, you kind of get a certificate that says you've completed this course of study. Those certificate courses are not academic courses, sure. but but you learn from them. We have 40 PhDs that have created these courses. <laughs> uh, so th- these are solid. They're made up of solid stuff. Um, but yeah, I think the, the interest in apologetics is actually increasing. In fact, Jay Warner Wallace, mm-hmm. whose name many of your listeners will know, former um, cold case homicide investigator and atheist who became a Christian, uh, he said recently Uh, evangelism in the 21st century is spelled apologetics. Mm. And what he means is in the 21st century, if you want to share Jesus with a neighbor, a friend, a child, a grandchild, you better know something about apologetics um, because questions, tough questions are going to come up. That's a great encouragement for people. Don't just assume that, that, oh, I don't need to know this. I, I don't need to think through the answers. It's, it's no, everything that we talked about at the beginning of our conversation is still very true. And you think about the people yes. in your life who don't know Jesus. Take the steps that you need to, to, to be able to ground your faith, to get those firm roots that you were talking about, to have the yes. confidence to be able to go into conversations and knowing that God is with you and doing that. But he's also saying, yeah. hey, I've provided all of these an- all these smart people yes. to think through all these answers. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I say, you know, read the book, Is God Real? Absorb some of these basic, I mean, it's, a, it's not a book that deals with highfalutin, um, ultra sophisticated <laughs> arguments. So these, these are things we all can understand, but do it not just for yourself to deepen your own faith and prepare you, but then give the book away. Uh, you know, give it away, re-gift it, you know, yeah, give it a yeah. Christmas to uh, to a friend or a neighbor or someone who's who's curious about faith and say, I know you've you've um, you've exhibited some interest in spiritual matters. I thought this book might help you because it's a, it's a book that deals with rationality and evidence and facts mm. uh, that point toward uh, God. You mentioned um, as a part of 
your programs through the school, you, you mentioned world religions. I'm curious if you've yes. seen a a rise in any maybe like one specific world religion that people come in asking a lot of questions about. There's you know it may be yeah. maybe there's a lot of movement towards that particular religion or school of thought even yeah is there is there one that you've noticed kind of have more interest than others yeah, yeah i think people are interested in islam uh, because of its presence on the world stage mm. and um uh, they want to know what what do, what do muslims believe do, do muslims worship the same god that we do mm -hmm. um is it just another way of looking at things or is it fundamentally in contradiction to Christianity? And the answer is it's fundamentally in contradiction. If you read the Quran, which I have many times, mm -hmm. um, you find that it specifically goes out of its way to contradict the very things you need to believe if you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. For instance, it says that Jesus did not die on the cross, therefore he was not resurrected. Uh, God does not have a son. Um, nobody can bear the sins of another. I mean, these are specific teachings of Islam that if you believe them, then you can't be a Christian. You can't believe in Christianity. So we actually have a course on our certificate level for people that want to just take a course at their own pace on online to learn about Islam and, and learn what it does teach and why it does contradict Christianity. Um, but what's interesting to me is that we have seen more Muslims become Christians in the last 30 years mm. than in the 1400 years since Muhammad. Mm. Uh, and the reason is God is doing, and I write about this in my book, The Case for Miracles. Yeah. God is doing something uh, something amazing. Um, he is sending dreams to people in closed Islamic countries, Jesus dreams, where people in a country where it's illegal to share the gospel where a Muslim will go to sleep and they'll have a dream in which Jesus will appear to them in the dream. Mm -hmm. And this is not just a subjective experience, yeah. because in the dream, typically what happens is Jesus points to someone else in the dream and says, you want to know more? Talk to my friend. Mm. And so this shows an objective reality that proves that the dream is not just coming something coming out of our minds. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. There was a woman named Noor. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, a Muslim woman, mother of several children, she fell asleep one night and she had a dream about Jesus. And she was just being in the presence of Jesus. The love, the grace that she felt was just absolutely overwhelming to her. Yeah. And, and she experienced it. And at the end, she said, Jesus, tell me more. Tell me more. And Jesus said, my friend will tell you. And she said, who's your friend? And he points to a guy who she didn't even realize was walking with them in the dream. Mm. And Jesus points to this person, says, he'll tell you more. Well, the next day, she goes to the crowded marketplace in Cairo, and she's walking along, and she sees the man from the dream. <laughs> and she goes up to him, and she said, you're the guy, you're the guy. He said, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? <laughs> you're the man. I saw you, same glasses, same face, same clothes. And he looked at her and said, did you have a dream about Jesus? <laughs> she said, yes. Turned out he was a missionary. Oh, wow. And he wasn't going to go to the marketplace that day because who wants to go on a crowded Friday? But he felt God had a special appointment for him. So he showed up that day and this woman inter intersected with him and he was able to sit down for three hours and open the Bible and share the gospel with her. Wow. This is what typically happens. And so you see there's a an outside confirmation, a corroboration mm -hmm. that this is not just something that's happening in their mind, but there's something more to it. And these dreams are so common that in the newspaper in Cairo, there's an ad and all the ad that says is, did you have a, or no, call this number and we'll tell you about the man in white you met in your dream last night. Oh. <laughs> and, and, and people call because they have these Jesus dreams. So seeing a huge influx of, of Muslims into the Christian faith um, as a result of that, and also apologists like the late Nabil Qureshi and others who have, have shared evidence for Christianity with Muslims. Um and but it's also created curiosity among Christians to know more about Islam. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I, I had a question about another kind of school of thought or idea. A couple of uh, weeks ago, I had uh, as a guest on this podcast the philosopher 
uh, uh, Douglas Grotius, and he was talking yeah. about the rise of apathyism. He said it's not necessarily yeah. atheism, and, and it's not it's apathyism. It's this yeah. I don't care, laissez faire mentality toward their spirituality. Yeah. How have you seen uh, that rise that he's talking about? I think it's huge. Um, I think one of the greatest obstacles to the gospel in the 21st century is apathy. Mm. It's people who just, they don't see the need for it. They, they're happy in what they're doing. Um, and many of them deep down inside know, you know what, if I were to become a Christian, I'd have to give up some of the things I'm involved in. And frankly, I don't want to give them up. Sure. I think that's really at the core of a lot of it. Um, but they just they throw up their arms and say, I can't really know for sure. So why really spend the time to check into it? So I think apathy is a major issue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the question you asked earlier is so important. If this is true, if God is real, what are the implications? Yeah. And when you look at it that way, you go, oh, my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> it is worth my time <laughs> to try to figure this out. Yeah, that's, a, you know, it's... It, Everything that we've talked about is true for the person who's in that state of apathy. They may not have the questions at the tip of their tongue, but it's still something that they're wrestling with, with deep down, but they're making the choice to suppress it in favor yes. of the now, in favor of their interests, you know, the flesh self, if you will. But it's yeah. still, but those questions are still very true and they still ring true for that person. They can't avoid them or run away from them. It's still going to come to yeah, roost at some point. <laughs> That's right. We can't ignore Romans 1 verse 20 that says that from creation, we have clearly known, it says clearly, we have clearly known, clearly seen mm -hmm. the invisible qualities of God, his power, his goodness, and so forth. We see that God exists from creation, but the Bible says we suppress that. Mm -hmm. And in the Greek, that, that, that word suppress that's used suggests it's like a pedal. And we push the pedal down to suppress what we see about God. Yeah. But then the pedal starts to come up. So we push it down again. <laughs> and then it starts to creep up. And we push it down again. That's the imagery of the Greek there. And that's our reaction. And that's why, you know, when we ask, is God hidden? Yeah. Um, one of the answers is that God is hidden because we're not looking for him because mm. we don't want to find him. Uh, that's one of the reasons yeah. he's, you know, we may not find him. Yeah. Because we're not <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he's there. He's just not, he, yeah. he might not be in the place that you're trying to find him. You're saying, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Hebrews and, and uh, Jeremiah, Old Testament, and New Testament, both say, if you sincerely seek God, you're going to find him. Yeah. So uh, if we seek him, we'll find him. But so, for so many, it doesn't say everybody's going to find him. Yeah. It says those who seek him will find him. Mm. And those that don't care or those who suppress their uh, the evidence they see around them that God exists, are the, and the ones who walk away from God are the ones ultimately that that uh, God allows them to make that choice. I mean, that's mm. one of the things I, I love so much about God. He gives us this choice. Yeah. And if he were to make himself so obvious, um, he takes away that choice. Because look at Isaiah. When he encountered God, it was like, um, I am undone. Yeah. He, he was he was he was torn apart emotionally seeing God on his throne. And um, um, so God has to modulate his level of exposure to us so that those who want to find him will find him. And those who don't want to find him won't be coerced into believing in him, but will um, be free in their choice not to find him. Mm. So the last question I have, Lee, before we wrap up our time is, what advice would you give for people who, who may not have engaged in like an active pursuit of apologetics before, but maybe yeah. they are now interested in asking questions themselves and seeking to answer, right? They've heard that kind of, uh, that charge that we've been offering throughout this, this conversation, and they want to take the yeah. next step. What advice would you have for them? Well, first of all, as we said earlier, don't be afraid of your questions. Yeah. Um, you know, the you know, it's like it's like when you were a little kid and you had a nightmare. You know, you ha you, you wake up, you're sweating, you're scared to death, your heart's pounding, and what do you do? You run into your parents' bedroom and jump into their bed, mm -hmm. and they say, "What's wrong?" And and so I had an, I had a dream; it was horrible. And they say, "Tell me about the dream." Oh, well, there was this monster, and he had five eyes, and he was living <laughs> under my bed, and he was green. And then you start to laugh and you think, "How did I even get scared of this stupid?" 
in a dream. <laughs> and it loses the dream, the nightmare loses its effect on you when you talk about it. Mm. And the same is true of doubts and questions. If you hold them in, if you say, I don't want to admit I have questions or doubts because then people at church are going to think I'm not very spiritual. If you do that and you hold them in and you don't talk about it, you don't deal with it, they can erode your soul. But if you let it out and you get in a conversation with a mature believer or you read a book like Is God Real or many of the other books that talk about the evidence um, and pursue answers, your faith will be stronger for having been refined like gold mm. through the through the fire and um uh, you'll find answers to satisfy your heart and soul so i think that's the one of the key things i would say is don't don't hold this stuff in pursue answers just like john the baptist did go after answers because there are good uh resources out there these days you know when i was an atheist and began to investigate christianity back in the the 1980s um um there was very little out there <laughs> for the average person to access. I mean, there were no hardly any popular level books on this stuff. Nowadays, there's a proliferation of wonderful resources out there that um, I mentioned Jay Warner Wallace. He's got some terrific books. And um, so there's no shortage of people willing through these books to help you find answers. And honestly, church is a great place to go. We think that uh, people look down on their nose at us if we ask questions at a church. No, the, the reality is that shows that you're willing to grow spiritually. You're willing to investigate spiritually. Three out of four U.S. adults say they want to grow spiritually. Mm. Well, how do we grow spiritually? We ask questions and pursue answers. Mm. So if that's if that's you, if that's the place that you're in, I'll put a bunch of resource links in the show notes to this below, along with a link to be able to purchase Is God Real, which is Lee's new book. Lee, thank you so much for your time. We're really excited for the launch of the new book to see what's going to happen with it, as it's happened with all of the rest of the Case for series, including the Case for Christ movie that came out a couple of years ago. So uh, well, we're, we're, we're really thanks. excited for how, how people are really feeling that call to bolster their faith. They're seeing these as resources and they're stepping out into the world to reach people for Christ, which is, I know, your heart's goal in all of this. So so thank you well, so much for your ministry. Thank you, Jason, so much. I appreciate that. If people want information about our center at Colorado Christian University for our online courses, they can go to strobelcenter.com and all the information is there. But sure. um, I appreciate you. I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate at Saddleback Church and the impact impact it's had around the globe. And uh, I, I'm, I'm thankful to be a friend of your ministry. Perfect. Thank you, Leo. I appreciate your time. <laughs> Thank you. God bless. I want to point back to something Lee said at the very beginning of our conversation. Apologetics isn't something to just escape from or hide from. It's an important facet of our call to spread the good news of Jesus to others. Some reminders for you as we close out this episode. First, it's okay for people to have questions. And it's okay for you to have your own questions. Don't stuff them down inside of you or get uncomfortable from them. But wrestle with them. Be okay having the questions, but don't be okay leaving them to their own devices. Go and do the research for them. As Lee said, there are so many resources out there now. Second, if somebody asks a question you don't know the answer to, or maybe you have a question yourself that you're just not sure of the answer to, seek to find the answer. It's okay if you're talking with a person and they ask a question, it's okay to say, you know what? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to do some research and I'd love to pick this conversation back up with you again, right? That's okay. Third, I liked what Lee said about how he asks questions. He says, if you could ask God any question and you would get an answer, what would you ask? And then there's the follow-up question, which was so powerful. Why would you ask that question, right? Remember that oftentimes there is an emotional element going on beneath the question. Fourth and lastly, I've put links to many resources in the show notes. I encourage you to check out Lee's books, including his new book, Is God Real? 
along with all of the other links uh, that are available for you. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation. I want to thank my guest today, Lee Strubel. My name is Jason Wheeland, and this has been Doable Discipleship, a Saddleback Church podcast. We'll be back with you again next week. If you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or a review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. You can also listen to these episodes on YouTube. Just subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you are already listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to the Doable Discipleship podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Don't forget to visit saddleback.com slash doable to check out all of our previous episodes. And go to saddleback.com slash grow to find spiritual growth resources and view a calendar of upcoming events. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows? Your question might just inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Jason Whelan, and I hope you'll join us again next week.